God bless your family. Good to be with you again. This is Pastor on this beautiful Sunday morning, May 23rd of 2021. I know that you, along with Pastor, is praying that all is well for the church family. And individually, I'm praying that you guys are doing well and God is continuing to smile upon you. So God is good and it's good to have you to be a part of another perfecting class. Now, the subject title of our lesson is Jesus is Lord of All. How true. Jesus is Lord of All. Our lesson text, now, if you have your Bibles, you can follow us with, look up your lesson text. Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 11 through 21. Romans, chapter 10, verse 11 through 21. Now, our golden text is Romans chapter 10, verse 13, and it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a powerful and very simple verse. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what's today's aim? Well, the facts is to study Paul's teaching on Jesus' lordship. The principle is to understand that the Lordship of Jesus Christ extends over all people. And the application, how can we apply what we learned today? To live in submission to Christ and proclaim to all people that He is Lord. Now, as we introduce this lesson, we're going to be reading the scriptures real quickly. And you can follow us with us. You have your Bible. Romans chapter 10, beginning at verse 11. For the scripture says, Whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call in him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went out, went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he said, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. All right, so before we introduce this lesson, let's ask God's blessing and his wisdom and insight to be uh, with us as we go through and study his word. So, Father, we do thank you for another perfecting class we thank you for another Sunday, for this is the day that you've made. We're able to rejoice and be glad in it. Now speak to us and speak through us to your people. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the Greek mythology, there are numerous gods. These gods exercise authority over certain domains. The power and influence of each one was limited to a particular jurisdiction. Jesus stands in the stark contrast to the fictional gods of Greek mythology. Christ has united, Christ has unlimited jurisdiction to his lordship. All creation is his, and his word is final. All who trust in the gospel and confess him as Lord experience the benefits of his salvation. So we know that uh, our lordship of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ is in no comparison to any Greek mythology 
or false gods. So, first of all, as we develop a lesson, we see that he is Lord of all. And here we find that Paul reaffirms the source of salvation. Both Jews and Gentiles, anyone, let me say it again, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord in faith will receive salvation. God does not show favoritism to any group or people. People of every nation, language, and background can call on Christ for salvation. Wonderful. And the only thing that they have to remember and what causes a lot of people to be concerned is that Christ has foresaid and foretold the fact that he is the only way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the way. And no man can come to the Father but by him. And that's a powerful statement, and it's a true statement. Now, there must be faith in the word. Now, the message of salvation is heard through the preaching of the gospel. God's message can only be heard through someone sharing it. So the preaching of the message, God's word, can only be heard through someone sharing it with others. And here's the kicker. God uses humans as his instruments, okay, to bring redemption to humanity. In other words, God uses people. He uses people to bring the message of redemption to others who are alive and well. So the Holy Spirit prompts and empowers us to share the gospel. And prayer from the church is critical to the global spread of the gospel. Now people, first of all, must willingly accept or reject the gospel. We do not force, we say it again, we do not force it upon anyone. Paul lamented the fact that not everyone accepts the good news. Nevertheless, Paul affirms the power of the gospel. So everyone that we share with will not accept the good news. But that doesn't matter. That should not prevent us from sharing the good news of our Lord and Savior. And next point, stubborn people. You know what pastor is talking about, and you probably have run up on some. Christianity began in Jerusalem with Jewish roots. However, many of them, the Jews themselves, rejected the message of Jesus. Jesus was their Messiah, and they rejected his message. So we realize that overall, the Gentiles were more receptive to the gospel than the Jews. And so... Paul was literally referred to as the preacher on behalf of the Gentiles. So we have to think about it. Those whom God loved and, and his chosen people, many did not accept Christ as being the Messiah. All right, now as we study the text, look at Romans 10, verse 11 through 13. In last week's lesson, Paul emphasized the need not only to believe in Christ, but also to confess him as Lord. He is not, if he is not received and confessed as Lord, we cannot genuinely claim him as our Savior. If Christ is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. I love that. Let's say that again. If Christ is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. In other words, uh, Christ should be Lord of everything in your life. Yes, there should be no off limits to God in your life. He should have access to everything. And I often say this, think of your life, your spiritual life, as a home. And in that home, you have different rooms. A lot of times we think about that. I remember, you know, uh, at home when I was a little boy, uh, we had certain places that we could sit and certain things we couldn't sit on. There was rooms that were off limits. And especially those rooms that had that very clear, hard plastic covering that furniture. There was no way we could damage the furniture because the plastic was so thick. But anyway, they were off limits. And when you think about it, it's the same way. God must be Lord of all. There can be no places in our lives, no private rooms that God does not have access to. Every room, every aspect of our life he has to be Lord over all. And right. So since the Lord always 
will always keep his word to his people, we can be confident that the promise of salvation is safe and secure for those who sincerely confess Christ. Yes, salvation is, is, is securely safe and God will definitely keep his word. And Isaiah 28, 16, says, Paul reminds the readers that those who trust in Christ will not be ashamed. Yes, if you put your trust in God and in God, in Christ, we, uh, no one, will be ashamed at all. All right, unbiased. Romans 10, verse 12 through 13. Now, although the Jews enjoyed a privileged position, yes, Jews enjoyed a privileged position position in God's plan of redemption. And Jesus coming open up the way to all people to be saved. So the Jewish by by virtue of who they were, their status as God's chosen people, uh, they had a privileged position. It's kind of like people in our country today. They don't want to admit it, but but there are certain races that have a privileged position simply based upon who they are, based upon their race. And that is true, whether people admit to it or not. So the Jewish themselves had to realize that they had a very privileged position in God's plan of redemption. But Jesus, coming to this earth, opened the way for everyone to be saved. And from the standpoint of history and our heritage, Jews had always had an advantage over the Gentiles. But from the standpoint of need, we're all equal. So again, from the standpoint of history, and you think of heritage, the Jews had an advantage. They were considered God's chosen people. But from the standpoint of need, we are all equal. There is not one God for the Jews and another one for the Gentiles. Isn't that special? So there's not one God for the Jews and for the Gentiles. There's not one God uh, for blacks and one God for whites. No, no, no. There's one God for everyone and for all of his people. And no one is beyond the reach of God's grace. And that's something that we should always be very thankful for. All right. Confident communications. Romans 10 verses 14 through 17. Since only those who call on Christ can be saved, only those who call on Christ can be saved, all right? It is true that the Lord reaches out to us before we reach out to him. Wow. So only those who call upon Christ can be saved, but you have to realize in this process of salvation, God really reaches out to us before we can reach out to him. He often does this so through a human instrument. Yeah, this in fact is the usual way people learn of Christ and respond to the gospel. So God, what Paul is saying here, God uses people to begat people. Yes, sheep begat sheep. Think about that. All right. So God will love to use any of us, and many of us can become an instrument for God to use in order to, to get people saved. Wouldn't that be special? Wouldn't it be something if you can account to the fact that you were responsible for getting someone saved, for, for rescuing someone from hell? I mean, it doesn't matter what else you accomplished or did not accomplish in life. If you can accomplish that one thing, it could be a loved one, it could be a spouse, it could be a family member or a relative. But if you can attribute the fact that they're in heaven because of you, my God, your living was not in vain. So God uses human instruments in order to reach people. Now the primary means of sharing the gospel in the early days of the church was through public proclamation. The primary way that they shared the gospel was through public proclamation or literally preaching. And this means that only those who are called to the gospel ministry should attempt to be preachers. And that I can attest to you. Only those called to the gospel ministry should attempt to be preachers. They say, you know, you have to be careful, you know. Uh, you, a lot of people have to check and make sure that 
if if they say they were sent that they they were indeed sent and just didn't went and you know what just wasn't went i just you know were you sent or did you just went did you just go did you just go because sure enough if you're going to uh, live this life and you're going to uh, be responsible for uh, the, the spiritual growth and the, and the spiritual life of others, individuals, you better be most certainly sure that you've been called and be sure that you didn't hear an echo from someone else. Because like, like, like uh, our Sunday school lesson says, we need to realize that uh, more importantly, that, that then financial remuneration is prayer. So more importantly than just supporting the church financially and supporting the ministry financially, is that the lesson is teaching us that there needs to be prayer and encouragement from God's people to continue what is often a very disheartening enterprise. He's saying to us, as, as sheep and as, as, as a flock, as a congregation, is that, sure, you're supposed to support the ministry. Sure, you're supposed to support uh, the pastor and his family. All right? But more than that, you should be more supportive with them, not only financially, but also in prayer. Because a lot of times, he's, he's saying in the lesson that what we do, we need a lot of encouragement. We need a lot of encouragement. Build them up and, and encourage us. And a lot of times, you, sometimes you see online where, where people can click on like or dislike a message. You know, it really doesn't matter. But any way that you can encourage your pastor, encourage your shepherd, would be something special. Something special. Because a lot of people run from this job of being... Uh, the shepherd over others because it's a great responsibility that we shouldn't take lightly. So as much as the financial support and things that you give for the ministry and toward the pastor and his family and, and, and the ministry and the work of the Lord, more so you make sure that you lift your shepherd and the family, lift them up in prayer. They need encouragement. We need encouragement to keep us going. And I thank you for it. Quoting Isaiah 52, verse 7, Paul reminds the Romans that the feet of those who proclaim the gospel are beautiful. No one likes to hear bad news or be the bearer of such news, but good news is almost always welcome. So we can share the good news of God. It's almost always welcome. All right, a question of hearing. Romans 10, verse 16 to 17. Simply making sure people hear the gospel does not guarantee its acceptance. Let's repeat that. Simply making sure that people hear the gospel does not guarantee that they will accept it. Just as ancient Israel often failed to listen to the messages of the prophets, so it was with the Israelites of Paul's day. Yes, many people don't want to hear the gospel. They don't want to listen to it. And Paul's point is that if sinners are to come to faith, they have to hear the message that produces faith. This message is the gospel, the word of God. And the words of the scripture are the only word of God that we are to make known. God's word must be the directing force and the foundation of all preaching. I'll say that again. God's word must be the directing force and the very foundation of of all preaching. Paul said, you know, how can they hear? How can they hear is what Paul is teaching us without the preacher. It is vitally important that both preachers and teachers engage in rightly dividing the word of truth. That is, correctly interpreting scripture. It's very important that you spend time as we try to study and correctly interpret the scripture. So if we want a stronger and deeper faith, it will only come as we hear, read, study, and apply God's words on a regular basis. And let's say that again. If we're looking for a stronger and deeper faith in Christ, it will only come as we hear the word, read the word, study the word, and finally apply the word 
on a regular basis. Amen. Now, our current condemnations, Romans chapter 10, verse 18 through 21, heard and rejected. Having just mentioned that faith comes from hearing God's word, Paul raises the question, have they not heard? All right, Paul, what's the question, Paul said, have they not heard? To a large degree, the Jewish people had heard the gospel, both in their native land and in the places where early Christians preach. And from preachers like Paul and others who had already gone. Now, significant numbers of Gentiles had also heard, answering his own question in the affirmative. Paul then quotes Psalms 19.4. In its original context, this part of the Psalms affirms that God creation, now think about this, God creation proclaims his glory to people who view it. He's saying that simply God creation, just, just God's beautiful creation, as we look around, it's preaching every day. It's telling us, you know, the, 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 the bluishness of the sky, the clouds as they float by, the grass and the trees as they sway, the, the vastness of the ocean. And at night we see the, the creation of the universe and, and the beautifulness of, the, of stars and planets on a canvas night, on a clear blue sky night. Well, we can see the heavens and the universe and the galaxies. He's saying that is preaching right there. Just the very creation of God is proclaiming his glory. You know, this did not just happen. You can't look at creation and you can't look at uh, the universe. You can't look at the planets and, and how things are organized and things have come together and say, you know, this just happened. No. Paul is making a very valid point that even creation itself is preaching. It's preaching every day to us that there is a God and he is ruler and creator of everything. So Paul is sharing here that, you know, they've heard, and even if they haven't heard, just looking at God's beautiful creation should be enough to convince them of the fact that there is a God. Now, Including non-Jews, Paul was taking the opportunity to try to provoke them to make way for Jewish conversions. So, in other words, uh, non-Jewish people were invited and they were receiving salvation. Let's refer to them as Gentiles. And Paul was thinking that this should be a way that hopefully would provoke Israel to jealousy in order to pave the way for Jewish conversions. But from the standpoint of Jews, Gentiles were considered a foolish nation because they did not know the true and living God. Now, however, Gentiles were coming to believe in that same God by trusting in his son. So the, the Jews considered the Gentiles or non-Jewish people to be what they referred to as foolish. Yes, you know, they were considered what is referred to as a foolish nation. But yet, the Gentiles are being saved. The Gentiles are being delivered by the same God. It, but it was, they, it was happening through the Son of God whom Paul preached to them, and they were receiving the same salvation, even so more. So they heard and received Romans chapter 10, verse 20 and 21. Continuing with two quotations from Isaiah 65, Paul again stresses the fact that Gentiles were coming into God's kingdom in spite of being outsiders. Aren't you glad of that? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And thanks be to the Lord, you know, we would be considered Gentiles because we are non-Jewish but aren't you glad that God extended his grace toward you and I? And we can truly say that we are saved and we have, we, we're, we have received, we have become recipients of God's mercy and God's grace through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, to continue with two quotations from Isaiah 65, Paul again stresses the fact that Gentiles 
but coming into God's kingdom in spite of being outsiders. Speaking through the prophet Isaiah, he said, God declared, I was found of them that sought me not. I was found of them that wasn't even looking for me. And another allusion to Gentiles becoming a part of the church of Christ concerning Israel. However, God had reached out to them many times over the centuries. In spite of that, Isaiah described them as a disobedient and gainsaying or obstinate people. This was not only true in Isaiah's day, but in Paul's time as well. Yes, you know, it doesn't matter sometimes. You will find some people who are stubborn, some people who are just simply belligerent, some people who just simply will is content in doing it their way and not trusting God as their Lord and Savior. That's right. They're disobedient and gainsaying. But this, however, as we get ready to close, did not mean that God had cast away his people. There was a remnant, and you have to always remember that there's always a remnant, according to the election of grace. In short, God was not finished with Israel. God was not finished with Israel. So God never totally cast away his people. There will always be a remnant. There will always be those uh, who, who trust God, who come to the Lord, who, who literally allow him to become their Lord and their Savior. And, and there's always a remnant. Sometimes I look at the faithfulness of so many people. And as we even go through this season, this past, I look at the faithfulness of so many people. But then I look at the unfaithfulness of others. But I don't focus on that. I focus on the faithfulness of those who are faithful and continue to lift them up in prayer and pray for them. Because God always has a remnant. There's always a small group or a small amount of people that is willing to, to, to study, that is willing to be a part, that is willing to, to support and give. And, and whatever God requires of them, God has a remnant. Always there's a remnant. And to God be the glory for that. And that's one of the things I like to say. I thank each of you. I believe that those of you are listening out there this morning, that you are a part of that remnant of God. And you do what you do because of who you are. And but you also do what you do because you know that if it had not been for the Lord, it's on our side, where would we be? We would literally be swallowed up. So God is good, family. As our lesson teaches us, Jesus is Lord of all. That means he's in charge. He should be in charge of every aspect of our lives. As we make him Lord and Savior, we want to make sure that he has access to everything, that there's nothing in our lives that we, are, we should try to hide or keep from the Lord. He has access over every aspect of our lives. Jesus is Lord. And that we say to him, be all the glory, be all the honor, and all the praise. So this has been a wonderful perfecting class. I pray that you've enjoyed it as much as Pastor has. And you be blessed. Again, may God keep you is our prayer and continue to smile upon you with his grace and his countenance. In Jesus' name, God bless.